This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is Andy Mills, the co-creator of Reflector, a new documentary podcast whose early episodes delve into controversial treatments for alcoholism and the free speech implications of the trial of rapper Young Thug, whose lyrics are being used by prosecutors to build a RICO case against him. Andy's a legend in podcasting circles. He helped create the New York Times podcast, The Daily, which is one of the most listened to shows on the planet. And he produced the wildly popular and controversial The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling for the free press. We talk about why podcasting is having such a moment, his tumultuous tenure at the New York Times, which ended with his resignation, and whether there's a market for investigative journalism that isn't done in the service of partisan politics. Here is The Reason Interview with Andy Mills. Uh, Why did you call it Reflector, and what are you hoping to accomplish with Reflector? Well, the original name was Parable, but that sounded a little religious, and we were nervous it might, uh, might read a little bit wrong. Although it's not entirely... (laughs) <laughs> I'm not sure it, it actually does read a little bit wrong because our idea with it is that there are all these stories that are out there in the world that on their surface, fascinating, interesting debates, maybe an uncovered uh, issue happening. But if you tell it well, if you like pay attention to the story long enough that you can also see it's pregnant with all these larger meanings and themes and difficulties about being a person or difficulties about navigating the internet or living in the era that we're in. And so our goal is that we tell stories that are well-reported, nonpartisan, open-minded, curiosity-driven, but that if you listen to them hard, you find that you're not only thinking about the subject at hand, but you think afterwards about things that we've never even mentioned. You know, you're kind of left reflecting. The idea is that like in a world where a lot of media is trying to get a quick reaction, like what if we intentionally turn the other way and try to tell stories that are about deep reflection? And then the other part of it, and this is really where the name ended up coming from, was that we were talking about how Matthew and I, Matt Bull, he and I, we met when we were at Christian College years ago, and we had this profound connection in our friendship because we had gone to be ministers and found that we may be wrong about some of our most foundational beliefs. And that can be a really troubling thing, but can also be a really freeing thing. And a part of our experience was learning about other people who had just as strong a conviction about their deeply held beliefs and seeing a reflection of our own experiences and theirs. And we are living in this time of great polarization and we wonder like, if you really pay attention to a story, even if you like, say you really disagree with J.K. Rowling, I do think when you pay attention and you spend time in her story, if told you know, well, that you can see a reflection of your own experience. It doesn't mean you have to agree. It doesn't mean you have to soften perhaps your ideological differences, but you can at least see that this is a person having a human experience or vice versa. Uh, I want to, uh, we'll talk about uh, J.K. Rowling and I'll put forward my theory, which so far nobody agrees with, that Draco Malfoy is actually the hero of the Harry Potter books. And yeah, no one agrees with that. Uh, no, surprisingly. But let's talk about Reflector. The first episode is about naltrexone, which is a drug used uh, widely in Europe to treat alcoholism, but hasn't really caught on here, partly because the way we talk about addiction, it doesn't make sense to treat addiction to one drug with another drug. I mean, that's part of it. But what drew you to that material? And uh, I highly recommend everybody check out this podcast. It is genuinely fascinating. Uh, Regards, we're going to talk about a couple of the other episodes. But, you know, how does that, you know, why did you open with that episode? And how does that kind of exemplify what you're going for? Well, I found my way in through two different avenues. One of them is that uh, I think like a lot of reporters who are here right now, I'm trying to figure out what happened during the COVID years, what that strange experience has uh, brought in its wake. And one of the things that I personally saw with my, myself, quite frankly, and a lot of my friends, is that those of us who like to drink, we were drinking. You know, we were putting it away. And then when the stats came out, it showed that 
essentially America had gone back 50 years and we were essentially at madmen levels of drinking <laughs> over the pandemic. And uh, it was an, among a number of things that happened during those lockdowns where our schedules were interrupted, where maybe our commute was shortened to just the bedroom to the couch. Yeah. Uh, and then I was thinking about, uh, then when these numbers came out that showed that actually from 2020 to 2021, uh, the number of alcohol-related deaths skyrocketed to uh, 178,000, which is twice of what they were in 2015. And I remember that in, to in 2015, when I worked at Radiolab, I had done a episode all about these new medications that were showing a lot of promise and how these medications might usher in a whole new and far more helpful treatment plan for people who struggle with over drinking. And I remember at the time, 2015, this is right when the opioid epidemic was starting to be front page news. I mean, this is before you really had addiction beats at the big newspapers and the big outlets. And I thought, surely this is gonna usher in a huge sea change. And it never came. And so I was drawn to it to say, okay, let's go back, let's talk, let's re-interview some of the people I interviewed nine years ago, let's talk about what's going on. But then my friend Katie, she had found her way through her over drinking with naltrexone and using the Sinclair method. And I just loved the fact that like, she found that because she found it like on the internet in the COVID years. And like the idea that like somebody doing their own research on Facebook and YouTube over the COVID years, like that's too funny. And, like, and, it, <laughs> and it ended well. She and didn't, she well. didn't just, also join ISIS or anything. Yeah, yeah, and so. he's talking about Katie Herzog, the co-host of Blocked and Reported, which is itself a fantastic podcast. Um, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to look at that. The, uh, your second episode is a two-parter, which if events today are any indication, the day we're taping this, it could be, this could be your whole podcast. Hey, spoiler, there's a third part coming. That's okay, so this is about the RICO trial of the rapper Young Thug in Atlanta. And we just saw bizarre developments where one of the defense attorneys was actually uh, arrested for contempt of court today. Talk about this uh, story uh, as, you know, in Reflector. What, what are you going for there? And what drew you to right. this story. Well, there's like two avenues in. So the first one is that for a long time, I've wanted to do a story about Tipper Gore and the moral panic around rock music in the 80s, which I know you've written about. And I've always wanted to steal man Tipper Gore and uh, because I disagree with her. I, th I don't think that, I think that there was an overreaction there, but I also think that it's worth trying to note why she and many parents in the 1980s were so worried about something that to us seems so tame now. Prince, Purple Rain, right? This is not exactly Marilyn Manson. Um, and it's important, I think, to, to go back and to spend time- And Cindy Lauper, She Bop. It's uh, was another, uh, by the way, that is, it's not even masked, it's about masturbation. Yeah, look. But I guess we're, we're let's not go fully down, yeah, memory lane Wap. here. Yes, that's right. From but then, sheep up uh, to wop is like a pretty big... Uh, but as I was looking into doing that story, I also was st yeah. stumbled into this rap on trial debate that has been happening in America for a long time, but since 2020, with a lot of racial politics getting a lot more attention, it had become a, a, a bigger issue. And I actually like the musician Young Thug. I think he's an incredibly talented hip-hop artist. And I was surprised when his lyrics were being brought into the courtroom and then I was even more surprised when I looked at the evidence and saw like it did appear that he was essentially confessing to crimes on best-selling albums. And that's just a bizarre world in and of itself. But then it also had this extra element where, you know, I believe uh, strongly in the First Amendment. I think like as a journalist, I can't be an activist about many things and I'm not really drawn to be, but that is the one thing that I think we journalists can be passionately in defense of. I love America's unique First Amendment freedoms and all that comes with it. You look thought, like well, you want to wrestle somebody right well, now. It does, yeah, I, it's like, well, because... Yeah. Is anybody out there against the First Amendment? Because he, he wants to kick your There's ass. a lot of diversity in yeah. this crowd tonight. I saw it. It's, it's an interesting mix you've gathered here. Um, but this story, it challenged my own assumptions because it does appear to me that you have, a, you have very valuable... Uh, you have worthy values 
one of them being the protection of artists' free speech, and the other one being the fact that you know, gang violence makes up somewhere around 70 to 80 percent of violent crime in a lot of cities, including Atlanta. And it appears that Young Thug and YSL are a violent street gang that are part of that. And it's very difficult to prosecute. And I love how hard it is. It's like I, I'm kind of an anti-fundamentalist at heart. And I love nothing more than like to be challenged by a story. And here embodied in this is not only the opportunity to uh, steel man Tipper Gore alongside T.I., which is a great challenge, but then to tell a story that just reminds us not to hold our views with too much yeah. certainty. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, that is also, it's a, it's a fascinating mix of voices and reporting. And one of the things you come back to again and again is that you know nobody took Johnny Cash seriously when he talked about going to, you know, shooting a man in Reno just to watch him die. Um, but with Young Thug, we believe it. Um, part of that is... You know, you talk about a kind of racialized, you know, uh, cultural set where it's like, oh, well, we believe him more because it plays into stereotypes we have about young black people who are into hip hop. Right. But then there's also a lot of evidence, uh, circumstantial evidence against him that he's actually involved in criminal activity. How do you think this is going to play out? Well, I think it's going to be complicated. I mean, if you want my like actual predictions, I'm not usually in that business, but I you can watch this trial live on YouTube every day. I watched a good hour of it today. I am not confident in the prosecution's ability yep. to push a jury beyond a reasonable doubt to convict the number one hip hop star in the world of this Rico case. Um, I don't think they're bringing their A game down in the prosecution's office in Atlanta. Uh, that being said, it's really messy because two things can be true at once. One of them is that obviously we have uh uh, plenty of evidence that shows that racial bias is a plague on our justice system. And at the same time, what's the reason that you don't see the same thing happening in country music you do with hip hop? Well, in the last two years, 21 rappers in Chicago alone have died. You know, FBG Duck, who we talk about, his little brother, FBG Cash. I mean, you've got King Vaughn. You've got some of the biggest rap stars in the industry, young men who are not only dying in these gang uh, fights in larger numbers, they've also increased since the pandemic, but because of this strange thirst for authenticity that we have in our culture right now, which I totally understand with all the bullshit and the, and the AI that's coming, it's only gonna get worse. We hunger for real. There is an audience that has shown up that wants to know it's real. They don't just want to see that you are from the streets and you're poetic, how you capture the life of the street crime, the street criminal, the gang boss, and your music. We've loved that since the 80s. What's happening now is they want to be able to say, I want to follow on social media who you and your crew killed. I want proof that it happened. And that's a really bizarre, and that's a new incentive structure that's playing in. And just so you know, FBG Duck signed a $1.8 million deal with Sony, like, nine months before he's murdered in the street. And part of the reason Sony showed up was Dead Bitches, his song that was essentially chronicling all the people that he, he and his gang had been involved in killing. And so we can hold two thoughts in our heads at once. Like One is we have to care about the racial bias because everyone deserves their, you know, it's the bedrock of our criminal justice system. And just because there is a pattern of behavior inside of street rap, that's connected to real crime, this person is innocent till proven guilty. And then you have to hold on the other side of your head the fact that there is something happening to where there's an incentive on these young artists to confess and brag about their crimes on social media and in their lyrics. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very human story at the end of the day. Did you reach out to Tipper Gore? Uh, which I did. She, yeah. Or she Al had, Gore, who was the one who actually sponsored the Senate hearings that she and other members of the Parents Music Resource Center uh, spoke at. I, Tipper Gore did not respond to my Instagram uh, message yeah. DMs, okay. but I tried. It'd be interesting to see where I also she reached is, out to Dee Snyder as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, if you guys haven't heard yet, uh, in the episode, we, we tried to say, like, this is the best face of Tipper's argument. Mm -hmm. This is the best face of D. Snyder's argument. And I think that 
you can totally get where they're both yeah. coming from. And it is a question of, I mean, in the, in the end, nobody, I think, is in favor of just trying to prosecute somebody because of song lyrics or because of writing, right? It, I mean, where do you come down on the idea that, you know, okay, so we're not doing that, but then it can be used as evidence to actually convict somebody? Well, I think I think of two different cases. One of them is this guy, Vontae Skinner, from New Jersey. He was convicted of murdering a, a known local drug dealer, sentenced to 30 years in prison. And in his criminal case, the prosecution dug up some, I, I believe it was SoundCloud rap lyrics. I mean, he didn't have a deal. He was a no-name rapper, local guy. And his rap lyrics were very violent. You know, you know, two slugs to the brain, leave you dead in the streets. Very violent and aggressive music. And they had... The prosecution had used this as essentially to say, like, look at the state of mind that this guy was in. He's telling you now that he wouldn't do it. This is the kind of stuff he was putting out on SoundCloud. But it had nothing to do with the actual case. And after he served six years, I should add, he finally got into an appeals court. The New Jersey uh, Supreme Court weighed in, and they said that it was, they essentially released him saying that it was wrong for them to use these lyrics that had nothing to do with the specific case to prejudice the jury against him. So that's Vontae Skinner. On the other hand, you've got the killers of FBG Duck. Uh, this is the rapper I was talking about. We profiled him in, in the second part of this series. And not only did the gang members who killed him in broad daylight, I should add, not only did they brag about it on social media, but they made diss tracks and records alluding to the, and essentially bragging about it, that they got him back because he had some, he had dissed them. And, and so I don't think his killers get brought to justice. And it's like, are we really going to pretend that that's not admissible evidence in trying to bring convictions? And not only, it's not just about the case itself. It's also about the broader structure of the fact that a lot of these uh, a lot of these killings, a lot of this violence, like I, I'm living in Chicago for the summer because that's where my creative partner, Matt, lives and he has kids, so I moved to where he is. Uh, uh, it, but there have been 3,000 gang-related murders there since 2019. And almost all of them have taken place in like two square miles of the city between these warring gangs. And the music, the social media... It's a part of it, and it's an interesting part. And one of the things I love about it is like, you can't understand that story as an ideologue. Like, you have to go into it with an open mind to understand the role that incentives are playing with the music and the music industry, with social media, the pressure that's there, the the, the kind of thirst for authenticity, the ratcheting up of so many things in our society. I like to blame it on the remake of West Side Story. Okay. I think that's, you know. Like the Draco uh, yeah. theory. Yes. Another you know, I, I have a lot of theories one. that are very uh, unique. Um, let's talk a little bit about the economics of podcasts. You are, you're doing Reflector as an independent podcast. You, you can subscribe to it uh, at um, Substack and whatnot. You're trying to do kind of a general interest magazine as a Substack, right? So, I mean, are there is the same set of people who are interested in figuring out how to stop drinking so much? Are they going to be interested in in rap lyric RICO prosecutions? And I, I mean, I am, but you know, what do you have in the pipeline, and how do you see yourself growing an audience for something that is more about the method that you're using to investigate something rather than a set of topics? Good question, Nick. Um, if anyone knows the answer, yeah, um, I have a theory, but you know, I don't well, want to. The, the theory, yeah. I mean, the business theory, it's it's a risk. I don't know if it's going to work. Like a year from now, I don't know if we'll have a show because the thing that we're doing is not something that you're seeing a lot of investment and a lot of people doing right now. It's definitely easier to throw up a hot take to do a quick roundtable. And I like those podcasts. I listen to those podcasts. I think that there should be a diversity among the landscape of every medium inside the journalism of, you know, this kind of, you know, storytelling, news reporting. We have a lot of options out there. The, the, the lane that I think that we're trying to exploit that we have a particular skill for is that 
because we're not ideologues, because we are coming to a lot of the most hot button debates, we're coming to some of the strangest stories that are happening in our culture without a dog in the fight. And with this particular skill of telling a compelling story with surprise, delight, a little humor, uh, hopefully a little tugging at the heartstrings, a, a, like a big idea that leaves you thinking afterwards more deeply about the world instead of like whatever feeling you get after you binge scroll and then feel lousy. Like that, we hope to find people who want that. And I think that there, the reason that we have hope for it is like that is what got me into public radio in the first place. I was just painting houses during the recession. And when I heard those early episodes of This American Life, those early episodes of Radio Lab, I was the different subject every episode. When even I heard like some of the work that was coming out of the more long form reporters on, on public radio, I was compelled by the way that I was caught up in a story. I was living in someone else's shoes. I was having ideas that weren't my own, that sometimes challenged my own. And I think that I do think that there are people who want that. We don't just want to be confirmed constantly that you're right and the people who vote like you are good. And then everyone who disagrees with you sucks. Like that's not a compelling story. And, and, and the thing that I turn to for hope is, is fiction. That's still the thing that we are doing in fiction. Like the great fiction of our era is complicated characters who maybe if you met them on the street, you would walk on the other side, or maybe you would argue with them if they were at your Thanksgiving dinner. But we are drawn to these figures in fiction because we see their complexity. And if you tell it, you know, the, the, I studied storytelling in my back. Uh, that's my like actual college degree, as silly as that sounds. But like one of the things I say when I talk about storytelling to people is that a well done story in fiction or nonfiction, but it's often done in fiction. If you're like caught up in the movie, you're caught up in this series. Eventually, the character who you've been spending time with is going to have to make a decision. And if you've done a good job as a storyteller, whatever they decide, you kind of get it. And I think that if we try and bring that like ancient love of story and that curiosity we have about people into media at a time of great polarization, and we can compellingly tell stories, even if they're different week to week and the subject matter doesn't have a lot in common, if they have that in common, that's what we hope to build on. What about the economics of it? Because uh, I've been reading analyses of, you know, where podcasts went from nobody had heard of them in the early aughts to, you know, starting, you know, in the by the teens, people were kind of familiar with it or, or they understood it as a derivation of something from this American life or or other longer form uh, kind of radio usually radio-based kind of storytelling programs. Um, you know, now it's something like 60% of people in America, the last stats I saw, have listened to a podcast. Have a podcast. Yeah, I was going to say, well, <laughs> this is what's really bad is 60% have listened, but 90% have a podcast Yeah, <laughs> in the past year. But there's also been, you know, the kind of growth in, in companies, uh, you know, Gimlet Media is one of them. Spotify is another one that went deep on podcasts um, and, you know, bought, brought in big name people and started doing stuff. And uh, Pushkin, you know, and they seem to have overbought. Um, yeah, Spotify and, shut down their whole podcast division. No, was, no, I mean, certainly not. Anything. But I mean, it, you know, they also seem to be shedding, you know, certain kinds of celebrity hosts and things like that. And I read one analysis that was talking about until about 2018, you could probably produce a really good podcast, like a reported podcast, um, you know, for like two people, maybe making 60 grand or something. And now podcasts become super expensive and things like that. You know, how how does that work? Because you've worked at every kind of concept level of podcasting. Um, where do you think that's going to shake out? I don't know. I'm curious about it. I mean, the model that people are using now, and I've followed it not because I wanted to, but because I think it might make sense, is this idea that if you can get an audience that's above 50000 an episode, you can make some money off those little ads that I'm sure you guys are hitting fast forward through. Don't tell the advertisers that. but. Um, and then you rely upon people. It's, I mean, it's the old public radio model. You rely upon people who say, I'll give you $4 a month, and I won't miss the 4 bucks. And if enough people give you that 4 bucks, that 5 bucks, that 6 bucks, that becomes enough for you to invest. And then, you know, there's grants that you apply for. You do all that. But, I mean, just to like, take a step back and just think, like, we are living through disruption after disruption, no matter what it is you're doing. 
in 2012, 2013, when I was at Radio Lab, we looked uh, like lustily towards these YouTubers that seemed like, man, they were setting themselves up to just succeed for the next, like they were so ahead of it. All those YouTubers also are done. Like they, their era came and their era went. And then we had our era, right? After 2014, I no longer had to work the brunch shift uh, in Brooklyn every weekend to pay my rent and my student loans because after cereal, there was more investment, there was more excitement, there was more money. We also, I was a union rep and we got some more money out of our company. That was nice. But um, then there was the, the Trump era, which didn't just affect podcasts, but affected, I think, a lot of media and I joined the New York Times four months before Trump was elected. And our big thing when I joined originally was that we had a number of series that we were going to do. Um, but then we thought sometime we would do some kind of daily show. But then after Trump was elected, there was an enormous amount of interest. And it felt like we should take a lot of the energy we were going to invest in trying to make a bunch of serial series. And we should make like the best damn daily podcast we can and then that ended up being very profitable right, right? that made a, talk, an yeah, enormous talk, amount. what's the audience for that that by many accounts is the most listened to podcast on well, a daily basis. i don't know if you know this but i don't work there anymore yeah uh, left, no, I've, heard, uh, I've heard left but. in a very strange way um no in 2020 i mean we would get five to eight million listeners every day which means we're like twice as big as your biggest cable news personality and that would translate into $26, 28000000 million in advertiser revenue. I mean, uh, that's, just, I mean that's a hit. We were the, that was, that was, that's when we were. How did you conceptualize the, you know, the daily and why do you think it was so successful or why it is so successful? I, th I think that we had a, number one is like we had a good mix. Lisa Tobin, Theo Balcom and me, we, we as journalists, as storytellers, uh, we were we had that kind of creative charisma that a, like maybe a good band has or something, and that's why I think we'll always be bonded for life by that experience. And also, I think that we at were at the right place at the right time. People were really interested in like suddenly in things that they're just not usually interested in. Like you wanted to know like who is the like secretary of transportation under Trump? You know, like they were suddenly, there was a lot interest. of uh, deep dives into the emoluments clause. People were into recall. this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I think that maybe they expected to have something that was maybe a little bit more straight and flat. And from the beginning, Theo, Lisa and I, and even, and Michael as well. And we that's the host. Michael's the host. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we wanted to, move people. We wanted to challenge people. This is in 2016, not too long after Dean Bacay gave this big speech where he was essentially saying, we did a great job in many ways. We got Trump elected and now <laughs> here's our second act. You've seen, yeah. you've read the, yeah. the transcript. No, no, but he was, I mean, he didn't, I don't know if he's exactly what he said, but the intonation that he gave was like, we kind of missed one of the biggest political stories in a generation and we won't do it again. Like we need to we need to like challenge even our own reporting and we need to do even more work to understand the country that we cover. And the daily was created in the midst of that, trying to make sure that we knew that a lot of our audience maybe has a certain political bend and we weren't just going to feed them things that were going to uh, pat them on the back. Now, you know, it's, it's been, I haven't worked yeah. there for a few years. Right. I can't speak to all those things now, but I do think that that was a part of the success. And uh, I and I wonder sometimes, like you were asking about, like Spotify, that wasn't the clearest bet to take. It wasn't even our. We didn't think that that was going to be our big thing. Um, and so when you look at Spotify, like Spotify paid an enormous amount of money to a royal person, right? Uh, yeah, talk who, about that. whose name I forget. What's her name? Meghan Markle. Meghan Markle. Because that's a, there's like a, a, a part of podcast, the interview podcast, that it, it can be intellectually stimulating all that, but it's also just interesting company to keep. You know, a lot of people are living their lives doing things alone that maybe they pop the you're headphones talking in and about, suddenly they're a strange company. You're talking about Meghan Markle right now, right? Well, I don't know yeah. about Meghan, but I'm saying, I think that there was an idea, like, number one, she's a weird, interesting celebrity 
like what a journey. She was on some suits show and now she's mm -hmm. royal. A USA network show. And then yeah. there was this there's there's this idea like that would might be interesting company. And there is there's this persistent belief that if you give if you make something around a celebrity, it will grow to the size of their celebrity. And I and I just think that that bet didn't work out. And it's not just been that one bet. I mean, I used to joke like when when I go to different podcast studios or I go to like a magazine that wants consulting on starting a podcast, they'll sometimes say, well, we've got this celebrity-ish figure that we want to do a thing around. And I'll remind them like Oprah's podcast failed. And that's Oprah, right? It, it, celebrity actually doesn't matter. It can get you a lot of episode one listeners, right? It can get you that initial attention. They get the TMZ and the whatever hits. But even with the wish trials of JK Rowling, there's a celebrity at the center of it. It wasn't like episode one was a hit. It wasn't until we got to like episode five or six that we started to see our numbers really, really go up because I think there was a lot of skepticism about was this going to be a good faith engaging piece of reporting or was this going to be ideological J.K. Rowling's awesome and her critics suck kind of thing? Uh, well, let's talk about that uh, program. You did that in conjunction with the Free Press, mm -hmm. which is a fascinating kind of supernova of, of new media, right? I mean, started by Barry Weiss and Nellie Bowles, who left the New York Times and kind of created an alternative space. With the witch trials of J.K. Rowling, uh, Rowling um, how did you come to that story, and how did you frame it the way that you did? Well, I originally came up with it in the summer of 2020, uh, when J.K. Rowling sent out several tweets that changed her public reputation in a matter of minutes, uh, in some ways probably forever inalterable. And I was working at and the New York Times. And this is where she was critical of uh, certain aspects of transgender idiology. Right, she waded into the sex term. and gender yeah. debate, um, and she did it without her kind of thoughtfulness that her, many of her public statements had. She was like making jokes, you know, and I think that both the fact that she seemed to be pushing back against an ideological view and the fact that she did it jokey uh, rubbed a lot of people wrong to say the least. I was working at the New York Times and I had just finished this podcast uh, series called Rabbit Hole and was working on 2020 coverage. And I knew that eventually 2020 would be over and a new series would need to begin. And uh, so I pitched the idea originally at the Times. It's like, what if we did a series around JK Rowling? And part of the draw was that I was seeing a lot of people calling for bans and boycotts of her books. I even saw some people burning her books. And I grew up very Christian in the Midwest. So you, and I remember You were like, hey, I've been there. And I was like, right? oh, Those, another one of these. Yeah, no, I'm bringing yeah. it back. No, it's funny. I, I you know, uh, the Harry Potter books were burned at various places around America because they extolled witchcraft. Witchcraft, yeah. yeah. And I thought, well, this is really interesting because here are two different groups of people who don't on the surface have much in common. The, you know, transgender rights advocates and their allies who are right now very frustrated with her. And then the American Christians who another time are frustrated with her. Like this is an opportunity to kind of dig into these two worlds, to see what they have in common, to see why Rowling is at the center of it. Rowling also was like similarly made fun of and made in very jokey back then what's happening in this world. And the times was interested in it, but not urgently, I guess right. you would say there was uh, more interesting things to them at the time. And I think, it just seemed scary to wade in for them. And so after I left the Times, um, this is where it kind of got more interesting is that uh, I wanted to pursue it as a show. Uh, Barry and the Free Press were willing to uh, fund it and put it out. And then I was talking to my friend Megan Phelps Roper, who used to be in the Westboro Baptist Church. Uh, she's not only a good friend, but she's a moral hero of mine. And she just ha happened to like need work for a few weeks. And so I asked her if she would do some research. I'd pay her some money, do some research for me, like find some old uh, YouTube videos of angry Christians yelling at JK Rowling. And she dove in deep, got fascinated with the subject. And suddenly it was like, wow, if you become the host, like what if this is now it has this extra added element, which is how do you know if you're right? Like, how do you know if you are showing courage to stand up for what, you think is right, even though you know it's going to cost you something versus like getting caught up in a moral panic. And of course, Megan knows that in part because the Westboro Baptist Church, say what you will of them. They have, that's courage to go up and say, they know it's going to be unpopular, right? 
but it's also bad, <laughs> right? It's, a, it's, it's also very corrosive for our society and for them, ultimately. And that became, now it was like this three woven yeah. rope of all the things I'm One interested in. One of the reasons I like Draco so much, it's not really the, the character, but the all of the younger actors, almost all of the, 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 the better known younger actors in the Harry Potter movies have denounced Rowling as a turf, as a transphobe, except for Draco. He's like the one actor who was like, the no, main she's, character. you know, she's a good person and we should, re we should respect her right of expression. Well, so, there've been a few others. Yeah. yeah. Few others, but. Uh, but they tend to be the older ones, you know? So, um, what, uh, what did the witch trials, uh, uh, talk about the numbers, how big was the audience for that? And what do you think it accomplished? Um, well, I, I think it helped to open up the conversation in a way. I mean, our big mission was, I mean, this, we say this all the time, it's like these two groups of people are having a hard time having much in common. Can both Rowling's fans and Rowling's critics like this podcast? Find it compelling, find it interesting. Of course, not all of them did. But I do think that we got, you know, many millions of people listened to it. And a lot of the feedback we got was, huh, I really liked, like I was coming at it from this and I didn't feel like I could tell, were you with me or were you against me, right? It had that quality that I really like. But then there's just a, an enormous amount of people. I think the majority of people were like, I don't really get why everyone's so mad. And what's going on with this thing on the internet? And it was a way to show that no one here, I mean, obviously there are bad actors involved, the people who are like going to J.K. Rowling's house, getting arrested by the police, threatening to kill her family. Like that's a part of it. And that aspect of the internet's influence on us, we also explore. But most of the critics and most of the supporters of Rowling, even though they have these great differences, once you hear them, I mean, they're understandable and they're so incredibly human. And it actually isn't always easy to know where to stand in the end. And I think that the, that's the thing that I was proud of by the end is that we actually did get a lot of feedback from people that felt like this is a conversation that's obviously going to be difficult and we're going to have to probably apologize along the way for offending and stepping on toes but it is really interesting it's worth having and it's possible to have it even with somebody who doesn't 100 percent agree with everything no you. um you also at the new york times you uh you uh, co-created i guess the series caliphate which was i uh, kind of on one the one hand was you know your biggest triumph but then also ended up you you had to give back journalism awards uh for it can you talk a little bit about what the show was and what the controversy was uh yeah so caliphate was i mean in the spirit of what we've been talking about today the idea there was like if you really were to spend time with people who were in isis and really see why they joined really understand why people middle class people in Belgium or Canada versus, you know, and also people in Iraq, like why would they join this thing that seems so clearly fucked up? Like, could you actually connect with somebody who was seen as like the monster, the ultimate them at the time? I think and sometimes we forget how many ISIS attacks there were and how huge that was and how it loomed large in our imaginations for months years. and years. Yeah, sure. it was a really, yeah. we moved on in a weird way uh, as we do so many news stories. Um, but, uh, I, and I feel like, I, I think we successfully did do that in a lot of ways, but then in the midst of creating this, it also became a bit of a like documentary about Rukmini Kalamaki, the star terrorism reporter at the New York times. I essentially just followed her around for almost a year, uh, as she did her job and tried to show like, how difficult this job is to, to bring out all of the like interesting resources and firepower that the New York Times has that tries to get stories right and tries to get to the front lines and all the dangers and the risks that people take. And I think that we were, on the one hand, we, we were applauded for that. Uh, and also I think it was just a compelling story. But then I think one of the more, I mean, it's a very strange and confusing experience to have because on the one hand, it's like I'm, more proud of it than I am of almost anything I've ever made. But then I don't know if, you, if everyone knows this, but the one of the former ISIS fighters who we spent a majority of our time with, he's definitely like the star of the series. He was arrested 
two years after our series came out and all of our awards were put on the shelves. Uh, and he was charged with a terrorism hoax charge. Essentially, the Canadian government felt that he had fabulate, uh, he was a fabulist and made this up and that he was doing it to scare people. And in the midst of that, we had to readdress our series and two investigations were opened by the New York Times at that point. One investigation called, So Did He Lie? Was He a Fabulist? And another investigation called, Did Rukmini and Andy Lie? Were th was this a Jason Blair situation? Were they trying to pull one over on us? And I, I will just say for people who, you know, maybe and a lot of people are critical of the New York Times, like, it was impressive. It's the thing you want to have happen. The fact-finding missions and the amount of energy that goes into solving those two investigations. Uh, in the end, I don't think that, I mean, in the end, just spoiler, like the investigation, we are not Jason Blair. They did not find anything that we were doing that was some kind of nefarious. We didn't make anything up. And is he a fabulist? We don't know. But there was definitely more evidence to make you think he was a fabulist that had we known then what we eventually knew in 2018, there were so many ISIS stories. We would have done someone else's story and uh, it's, a, it's a black eye on, on this thing that I'm very proud of in a weird and confusing way. Before we continue with the Reason interview, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Lumen, the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. Then on the Lumen app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workouts, sleep, and even stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your Lumen first thing in the morning, and you'll know whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then Lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals, so you always know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. I've tried Lumen, and I've got to tell you, it's a great tool for motivation and information. It's easy to use, and it's fun to use. Your metabolism is your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food you eat into fuel that keeps you going. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, and better sleep. Lumen gives you recommendations to improve your metabolic health, and it can also help women track their cycles as well as the onset of menopause. It can adjust recommendations to keep your metabolism healthy through hormonal shifts so you can keep up your energy and stave off cravings. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me and use interview to get $100 off your lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N dot M-E, lumen.me and use the word interview at checkout for $100 off. Thanks, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode. And now back to the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie. What does it feel like to, yeah, I mean, that's just a real kick in the gut. And I'm just curious, you know, emotionally, when you, you know, when you get the news that this guy may be a fake or is effectively a fake, what, you know, how, do, how does that make you feel? Well, it was a little deja vu because if you listen to Caliphate the series, episode four is when we realized he lied to us in the series. Like, so when making the series, I eventually, Rukmini and I had to grapple with the fact that he was definitely lying about aspects. So we built that doubt into the show and showed a lot of uncertainty. But at the end of the day, we assumed there was more likely a chance than not that he had actually joined ISIS and gone to Syria. And now, I don't know. I, I, I just... We'll never know. But yeah, the part of it that breaks your heart is like, I I mean, I, I, I empathize with him a lot. And I, I was moved by his story. And if you listen to the podcast, like when it gets to the credits, I didn't just like report and produce it. Like I wrote music. I, I'm like spending time scoring music to this guy's emotional journey of what's going on. And now I have to think like, was he just making that up? That's a terrible feeling. And then also just like we have these amazing resources at the New York Times to tell these stories. And there are thousands of stories we could have told. And to think like, did we use all these resources to tell a fabulous story? Yeah. That's terrible. What is there a lesson for 
the rest of us who are fundamental or primarily consumers of media, what what's the lesson that we have to take away from that experience that you had? Well, I mean, it's the lesson of all my stories, which is like doubt is better than certainty. Um, and as much as we put that into the series, even more doubt was <laughs> perhaps uh, called for. And yeah, but just like, I think this, I, I, I'm like looking, I know many people in this crowd, like it's a weird balance. You can't not believe anything in the media, but you should never believe anything totally. Like this, we are humans doing this. And we, many of us anyway, are doing our dogged best. But at the end of the day, don't take anything 100% with certainty. Do you have, are there certain tells to look for when we're consuming media? I was I think earlier today, I saw a, a very short, but a completely well-made deep fake of AOC saying something stupid, but within the realm of possibility. Um, and we could do this with any political character from any point on the uh, on the spectrum, except for libertarians, of course, who are never embarrassing, right? Yeah. Uh, no, no, but no funny um, hats. Yeah. Or anything. Um, but you know, what what are the tells? What do you look for to become a without becoming nihilistic? How do you you know how do you become a good consumer of media where you don't get you know hoodwinked all the time? Well, I mean, I think everyone has to come up with their own metrics, but generally, if you are on the internet and you see something that seems to affirm all of your prior thoughts, and you're like, oh, fuck, yeah, I'm going to share that. Like, take a beat, because that's just not the real world. Like, it just isn't. Like, there's, it's almost, it just almost never happens that the people who you dislike have done something as stupid as the internet has made it look like they just did. And, um... That's, that's that's definitely what I and and it's it's trying to ask yourself like as we do as journalists like it's a big question I've been thinking about lately it's like what is journalism for and then on the other end of it what are you consuming journalism for like what do you really want to know like if you're going to look at the congestion pricing drama why because you want to maybe you want to be informed about what's happening maybe you just hate Kathy Hochul and you're just like oh I want to get angry at Kathy Hochul like. I think that those are the those are the values questions that I think that we as journalists need to be asking more, and then as consumers too. It's like, why am I scrolling through this? Why is this something I'm subscribing to? What value is it bringing to my life? What value is it then generating for me and my community? And that's the number one way to avoid getting caught up in um, these echo chambers and yeah. rabbit holes. Um, you grew up in a place that's very different than I think a lot of your peers at the Times did, or a lot of people in New York or on the coast. Um, you mentioned it that you uh, you went to a Christian college, and this, was, this is a very Christian college, right? This is uh, that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, uh, that Catholics are probably more satanic than any other group on earth, right? I mean, we're There is talking weirdly a lot of Catholic Jack, animosity. Jack yeah. Teach, as a, somebody who was raised Catholic, I fully understand it and endorse it. But, I mean, this is real evangelical Jack T. Chick type stuff. Um, you know, uh, how, and now you're not that anymore. Um, talk a bit about how coming from there gives you an insight into the world, um, you know, that is perhaps different than most of your peers. And then talk about, you know, why you no longer believe that. Why I no longer believe. In yeah. yeah. um, the, I guess, in the faith that brought you to the college that apparently was Christian, but not free, because you mentioned having student loans. That you had oh, no, they are not free, yeah. these okay. colleges. Um, although I did get a scholarship based on how, how good I was at preaching as a 16-year-old. I was pretty good up there behind the pulpit if i do say so myself um okay so i mean there's a lot the <laughs> there's a lot there well where, so where did you grow up I, mean, I grew up in a small town in the midwest and i had a profound religious experience i mean like a lot of small towns in america the church is not just a thing that you do on sundays it's the social hub it's really for a young kid like me who liked reading 
It was the intellectual hub. You are having debates about the meaning of life, right and wrong. Uh, it's also a place where you get affection and encouragement and told a story that you are loved by God. The creator of everything also created you and he loves you and he cares of you and he's present with you even right now and he's given you gifts. And that's a compelling and moving story. I'm like almost going to cry as I remember. I, like, I'm, I'm with you. It's I foundational. It. It's yeah. huge. And of course, uh, with that also came the what I now believe is is the kind of false sense of certainty that everyone else was totally wrong. Other denominations of your faith, definitely other faiths. And when I went off to uh, you know be a minister after I felt this call towards the ministry, it didn't take long learning more about the history of my own faith and seeing that I wouldn't even recognize the Christians of 200 years ago, uh, let alone the Christians of 70 years ago. And then two was meeting people who were just as convicted and felt just that same sense that I was talking about from their own faith and Islam and Buddhism and whatever. And I started to realize, like, I, I felt this shift happen to me where instead of feeling this calling to preach the true word and get everyone to believe what I already believed, I became deeply curious about why anyone believes anything and convinced that if we could spend time learning about the different experiences that shape a person's belief, that we might live in a better, more pluralistic democracy. And that's how I ended up becoming a journalist. And like, that's, that's my bias. My bias is like, not everybody, but for most people in most worldviews, they're not fucking crazy. Like if you even like, I think I told you guys, one of my best friends was in the Westboro Baptist Church till she was twenty six. She was not crazy at twenty five or twenty four. She wasn't even a bad person. It's she, it, and she now has to wrestle with the fact that she still is, in some ways, the person who did those things. And I just like that became a very compelling and, and in some ways, a, a very troubling experience. I mean, to realize that you might be wrong and that you just went to a Christian college and you're gonna have to think of a whole new life plan. But then it's very liberating on the other end where it's like, I don't feel the stress of having to save everyone and having to push everyone in my own worldview. And I found a some, somewhat like religious like calling to being a journalist. I, I am, this isn't just a thing I do nine to five. Like I really do believe in the importance of trying to play a role in our society, especially in these polarizing times of bridging these divides between people and especially seeing the like we're up against the phone and it's for whatever reason polarizing force that it has um we're going to go to audience q a uh after this next question um talk a bit about your you you ended up resigning from the times um and uh, well, this is like the last question like, well before we go to before... audience q a yeah so um but um you know, what was the experience there in terms of kind of what now gets called wokeness? Um, and did you see, um, you know, why did you resign? And I guess, and this may be something very different, so I apologize if it is, but when, you know, people like John McWhorter, who's a columnist for the time, talks about wokeness as a religion. Um, does that ring true to you, given your experience in a kind of totalist worldview where there is a very definite us who have revealed truth and, you know, and are right versus them, which is everybody else. Does that, you know, do you see that in newsrooms around the country or at the New York Times when you were there um, in a way that is worth kind of discussing and kind of understanding and, and kind of complicating? Yes. Uh, I was, I was surprised by a lot of things moving in 2011 to New York City, never having visited. Uh, it was a culture shock in a lot of ways. But maybe the most surprising thing was around 2013, 2014, starting to see, especially from some of the younger staffers at WNYC, and then I saw elements of this at the Times, starting to see something that looked a lot like the fundamentalism that I had so excitedly left. And I've tried to figure out 
uh, I'm curious about it. Like, I'm not a culture warrior. I'm not like, we've got to stop these. Right. I'm just like, oh, what's this about? I think Michelle Goldberg, columnist at the time, says it well, that like there has always been a certain personality type drawn to like leftist progressive politics mm -hmm. that likes to moralize, likes to stand on top of the moral high ground and to belittle people mm -hmm. who aren't woke, who aren't enlightened as they are. That's not a new feature. Uh, and I think that some of it maybe was that. But the other thing I think is like, we could talk about it all night. Like there's not a lot of markers for meaning in a lot of people's lives. There's a hunger and a lust for justice. There's a desire to make the world a better place. And people don't feel like they know how to. And I think that for some of those people, they wanted to use the power of the media and they weren't drawn to it. I'm drawn to it for my own ideological reasons. I have this mm -hmm. belief that if we hear each other and we report fairly and even-handedly and nonpartisan, we can make the democracy function better and live in a more peaceful, pluralistic society. They were coming out with their own, which is that there is a certain set of politics that would be better and more beneficial. And they fell into, the, I think, the temptation to become mm -hmm. essentially like cops and, and these moral mm -hmm. deputies on behalf of what they saw as justice. And there has been, over the last several years, a clash of these ideologies mm. inside of newsrooms as they try to figure out how they want to proceed in an ever-changing world. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think of it like, like there's, a, there's a number of these buckets. You know, like there's a, like the Jay Rosen class. Uh, mm -hmm. I talk about this sometimes. Like he's a professor of journalism at NYU. He wants there to be like an abandonment of objectivity. Both sidesism is the great enemy. We're being mm -hmm. too obsessed with fairness to build up a sense of public trust. We should abandon that and instead essentially you know, be pro-citizen, pro-democracy. And reading between the lines, I think often for Jay Rosen and that crowd, it's like, it's a part of the, you know, the, the, the arm of the Democratic Party who thinks like our, view, our policies are actually really popular. It's just right. we're bad at communicating them. And if only we could communicate them better, the working class would flock to us. Right. They, I think, are like trying to say that should be journalism's job. But they still believe in like the principles of free speech and that. And then I think this other thing that's gotten more attention, especially in crowds like this, because they are sometimes the fuelers of these public shamings, they have less of an ideological goal and more about a sense of grievances hmm. and this desire to do whatever is necessary to tear down the structures that have they believe perpetuated injustices for too long. So like with my own experience, I mean, the Times is a big place full of a lot of different worldviews and a lot of different reporters. And this idea that like it got took over by the woke mob, I don't, I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen evidence of that. I think instead what happened was that there was a turbulent time, especially in the summer of 2020, when these competing worldviews ran into factors like work from home, Slack channels that had mm -hmm. become too much like Twitter, and the fact that I think even the heads of these institutions were having the experience that a lot of us were having, of being like, are we on the right side of history? Are we mm -hmm. doing things right? Are the foundations and the pillars of our journalism, are they sound? Do we need to be more activist -y? And I think it was a worthy moment that no. I don't, I disagree. I don't think that James Bennett should have been right. pushed to resign. Obviously, I wish I had not gone through the experience right. and had to resign. But this is the thing. like They didn't behave like a bunch of crazies. They behaved in a way that is relatable and understandable. I even, as it was happening, disrespected it, but I understood how they got there. You know, yeah. like In my situation, they just knew that if I were to resign, the public shaming campaign that I was in the midst of that was beginning to affect my colleagues and my coworkers, they knew it would go away. And it did. Within two hours of me resigning, no one has ever said anything about it ever since, <laughs> right? And that was, I think, what was best for my team, even if I didn't like the result in the end. Um, and, I, and I think that there's evidence now that with a few years hindsight and with Twitter being broken by Elon Musk, I do think that the dynamics have really changed. And um, What do you, know, you mean by that? I don't think that... I just don't think that if the Tom Cotton essay, right, that's the big right. thing everyone knows, right? Tom Cotton publishes this essay in the op-ed section, a big uproar leads to his ouster. 
to the editor who was the head of yeah, the opinion. The head, page yeah, at the, the, time. the yeah. our our editor of the opinions desk. I just there's no I just don't believe there's no way that happens today. Yeah. I just don't think I think that the lessons have been learned. I think that Twitter was an obsession that a lot of journalists regret. Um and they, they you know, like I said, they're we're all trying to figure this out. It's just human beings. Yeah. Like I know the I've met many times the publisher of the New York Times. He's just a guy. And he's trying his best to do his difficult job you well. Are, uh, he's in the same situation we all are. Does, does anyone here feel like they have a healthy relationship with their phone? Yeah. You know, like well, we're all I trying know, to figure but it out. But you're disconcertingly Christ like and willing to turn the other cheek, it seems to me yeah. still. You know, come I out of my beard. So yeah, come out of that. the wilderness already. Let's uh, have some questions from the audience. You talked about confirmation bias. Um, kind of, and, and that's what people are like. If I hear, if I got a nickel for any time somebody said to me, but I read an article that said, and that became their gospel, you know, I, I'd be wealthy. Here's my question. The opposite side, the people that are thinking that way, they're only looking for confirmation bias or whatever, what do we do, what do we tell them to go, where do we tell them to go to see the other side, if we can get to them, to see the other side of this, what they think is the absolutely only answer? That's, that's a great question. And I mean, my answer, I don't know if it's, we should talk in a year. It's the it works, reflector, right? Reflector. Um, tell, uh, yeah. Everyone loves a good story. Tell a yeah. better story. And the truth is that we're not up against stiff competition. A story called This Guy Sucks and Here's Why doesn't win the Academy Award, uh, mm. you know, like, it doesn't, that's not the bestseller. Like, there's a reason that we still read Anna Karenina, and it's not because mm. we care that much about all the weird old 19th century Russians, 19th or 18th century. Mm. I read it once, and uh, yeah. I was confused. But it's because... It's 19th. It's just, it's a mess, and it's a, we're, we're drawn to that. And I just think that many of the greatest storytellers in our industry for a number of complicated reasons, I think they have been muzzled for the last five, six years because they feel that if they're too generous to the quote unquote other side, to the wrong side, they might lose their jobs. And they've got plenty of reason to be nervous. There's examples well, out there. What does that but mean I do feel for it's, many it's, reasons? It's shifting. That, yeah, like well, what does that mean? If you, if you have something good to say about Donald Trump or Republicans, you're in trouble if you're in legacy media? Or what, what are you saying when you say for... People are feeling muzzled. Like, who's muzzling them? I mean, the dyna we all know why in 2020, sharing an opinion that you knew that your, cor your corner of social media, whether you're an Instagrammer or Twitter or whatever, sharing something on your corner that would be a divergent view from many of the people who you loved, you respect, you went to college with, whatever, you were nervous to do it, weren't you? Hmm. Just pull that outward. That was all of journalism. I mean, it's even little things. Like, I mean, this is like the silliest story, but like when I was in 2020, when I was in Iowa, we were covering the biggest story in the world, January 2020. And it wasn't the pandemic. It was the Iowa caucus mm. for the Democratic primary. Who's going to be the candidate that goes right. up against Donald Trump, right? We had no idea what was coming our way. And we were door to door. We're knocking the politics team for the Times. And we came back drinking at the bar. What's everyone hearing today? And we were all hearing the same thing. Iowa likes this guy, Pete. And so are we going to write the mayor? Who's going to write the mayor? Pete looks like he might win Iowa story. No one wants to write that story because in the journalism circle on Twitter, the narrative was media loves this guy. And every reporter knew that if they published a even remotely flattering story about mayor Pete in this moment, they weren't reading the room. They were going to get like totally laughed out of the room. But then what happened that night is we found out that two staffers were quitting the Pete Buttigieg campaign because they said that his campaign staff lacked diversity. Everyone wanted that story mm. because it, and it, it's because of human nature. Like they, they did, you know what ended up happening? I don't know if you guys know this. Mayor Pete won Iowa. It's mm -hmm. a thing we all forget. We didn't do much coverage of it for a reason. Wow. And that's just like, it's not a conspiracy. It's just no. human nature. These guys went to college with the people at the Washington Post and they're competitive with political, like they don't want to be the person who puts the story on Twitter just like you didn't want to say something on Instagram that might get your sister-in-law mad. Like it's just, yeah. we're all navigating the same space. Okay, next question. So 
you, all the people that you really talk about on these podcasts, the, the, the central figures are what you call true believers, right? And that which was the title of a book by Eric Hoffer, uh, which is a beautifully written book. I don't know if you read it, but it's, you know, Hoffer had an idea about these kinds of people that even though you say that what they say makes sense, that in fact, if you really dig in, that there's like these complex, nonsensical, psychological reasons that are deep, you know, like they're, they're caught up in some archetype of being the, you know, the knight slaying the dragon or something like that, or, or even worse, you know, there might be more. I've read a lot of Joseph. <laughs> <Campbell's> <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. So, what's the... so, so I'm, just, I'm just wondering, you know, if, you know, if you, you know, if you've thought about, I, re I really love J.K. Rowling, but I don't think you went quite into that territory of like looking at the, 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 the kind of the underlying psychological stuff going on behind some of those people's positions. And I thought if you've ever thought about going that deep. Well, thank you. I, I would love, I think it's good feedback. I mean, we, wanna, we always want to go deeper, right? And, you know, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling was seven hours, seven episodes long. I spent, me and Megan spent five days in the end with Rowling at her house. We have hours and hours of conversation that we didn't air. Um, just because there's like, we assume there's a limit to people's curiosity and understanding. And, mm. but I mean, I, I point well taken when I'm, what I'm saying about how like they make a certain sense. I'm just saying like, if you want to understand, like let's say like the Houthis, mm -hmm. how impressive in a way that the Houthis have done, like they're batting above their average with what they mm. just did. They shut down so much world trade. And I was a little bit frustrated as a person who is interested in the Middle East and I've lived there and I studied these different branches of uh, Islamic movements that the Washington Post and the New York Times, two great institutions, they both put up their, here's what you need to know about the Houthis. Mm. And I was heartbroken. Neither of them talked about their theology. They didn't talk about their religiosity. And I was especially frustrated because they had just done a profile of new speaker of the house, Mike Johnson, two weeks before, and they went all into his religiosity, right? Mm. And I'm like, how do you miss this? Because for me, one of the things that humanizes the Houthis for me is understanding that they believe that they have been called by God, that they have a mission far bigger than their own lives, and that they're getting confirmation that God is helping them because they're able to go up and win battles against Saudi Arabia, against their own government, and they now are in the Red Sea just totally bending the world to their will, and they feel all this confirms that they are on this righteous path from God. And I find that as a bridge to helping and understand them and can be, that's the kind of thing like, I can sometimes be frustrated. But then I also remember like you're asking like, what did I see when I moved here to New York? Well, I can't expect people who've never had profound religious experiences, a lot of New Yorkers, maybe some in this room, not interested in religious experiences. Mm. Like that's the thing that they are not gonna publish because that's not a thing on their mind where of course it's gonna be on my mind because it's the most profound experience of my life. Yeah. Next question. I also grew up in the Midwest. Ooh. I'll give you the handshake later, the secret handshake. It ain't pretty, but it's nice. <laughs> That's what we say. <laughs> Having grown up in the Midwest, though, I also recognize something uniquely Midwestern about your approach. And I wonder, and since I lived here when Trump was elected and saw everybody go absolutely insane, um, I have wondered about what we can do, what I could do. I'm thinking, we need an exchange program like they used to have between, you know, U.S. and France. We could have, like, people from in New York go to Indiana and vice versa. What, what do we do, us good, solid Midwesterners, to colonize the cities? Uh, I mean, uh, or more well, you're doing a pretty good job because the Midwest <laughs> is losing people compared to other regions. So you're sending a lot of missionaries out, but they don't come back. But uh, just in, in all seriousness, how do we inject more of that? Is there something we can do? What other ideas? I mean, clearly you're doing a lot with your podcast. Great job, by the way. Um, do you have other ideas? Thank you. I mean, I do love the exchange program. And if anyone, I, I have a, uh, I live in an old bank in a town with 1,000 people in it in the middle of nowhere in Southern Illinois. Well, you're really selling it. I've got two it. extra rooms in the yeah. old bank. Anyone can come down and see the absolute middle of nowhere yeah. rural life anytime. Uh, I mean, this is a huge part of the, the thing that a story is supposed to do is a well-told story can transport you into the life of somebody so different than yourselves. I mean, movies do this great. Like, literally, you're like, I'm like transported into the life of Furiosa, this person. Right? If, if, if you do it well, you're lost in it. And that can be the same for 
a, a true stories as well. I think it has to be. So that's the thing that we're trying to do is to tell people these stories that help you build a bridge to understanding the, the people who feel so other than you are not. They, they are running on the same hardware and they're often ingesting similar software to you. The stories is just like, that's, that's the number one part that I know of it. And it's also like just trying to create truly diverse friendship groups. I mean, I think one of the best things about my social circle is I've got people who you would call woke. I've got people who you would call like Trumpers. I've got people who are mm. all shades in, in the midst. I've got people who are religious believing Christians and then people who are hardcore atheists, you know? And I find it enriches my life to have those people in their perspective. And I spend time not trying to badger them into seeing the world the way I want it to be seen, but to listen to them and say like, what did you think? And of course I'm challenging them. Of course mm -hmm. we fight, like, but we fight like in the kind of Jewish tradition of like, mm -hmm. the like, let's have a good holy argument because at the end of the day, we're trying to get closer to something like truth. Thank you. Uh, let's do one more question. How do you continually bring um, these different perspectives and holding those different places to your stories? Um, I, I think about, um, I think I have I have some of these different overlapping, you know, circles, and how I think about story and and um, the stories of the day. Do you ask them? Do you get people's opinions? You know, the people you care about, the people you love, like, and how do you then honor those stories? Uh, well, there's like an art to an interview, where you have to do two things. I just, I'm a firm believer that you have to do two things well if you're conducting an interview in the field, especially with somebody who's not, you know, coming to this with any prepared remarks. Right? You have to be prepared yourself, having thought through the ways to engage, the ways to get the good tape and all that. And then you have to really be present with them. And then act, like don't just go on to the next prepared question because you thought for hours about it. But, like listen and respond to what they're saying. And I, I find that like, I don't know. I don't know what other people's experiences, but if, if you really like half the time I'm interviewing someone, I have like a crush on them. Like, mm. I just like, I, I can't help but be like, I get you. Oh, tell me more, you know, and then try and lean into that. Even sometimes when like the person has abhorrent views that I hate, you know, I keep coming back to my friend Megan with the Westboro Baptist church. Like, I just can't tell you how wonderful a person she is. And I know that that didn't happen the day she left. That the seeds of that were like planted and grew even in one of the most despicable worldviews that we have. And it, it, she remains a moral hero to me because no one has more reason to be mad at her family than her. They've completely cut her off. Oh, it like breaks my heart. Mm. But like, she won't forget that like, they think they're doing the right thing. And it was just like mm. crazy because clearly they're not doing the right thing and it's 2024. Mm. At a certain point, they're going to need to figure this out. But like the fact that she's willing to have a relationship with them, she's never asked them to leave the church and have a relationship with her. She's willing to have it with them. I just think like, well, surely I can connect with somebody even though I really don't like their tweets. I really, oh, I'm, you're voting for that one? I don't like that one. Like, I always turn to Megan because, like, if she can find those wellsprings within her, then we all can as well, for sure. Thank you. Uh, final, final question. Uh, what's what's next at Reflector? What's the next episode? Well, the next episode of Reflector, I th thought was going to be a look back on the witch trials of J.K. Rowling, like we're okay. going to do this. But uh, today, what is she like, by the way? Is she like a slob at home, or does she does she have house elves, or she calls she her her servants? No, she's exactly like she, everybody's Dobby. She lives in like a lovely. She's very small yeah. and lives in a lovely castle, and <laughs> it looks like Harry Potter. It looks like the author yeah. of Harry Potter lives there. Okay. Um, but so it's yeah. not going to be about her. No, I, I this is like I don't know. It, Today we finally got the rapper Killer Mike to agree to sit down and we interviewed oh, him wow. this afternoon. So we're gonna do a little more deep dive into this. He helped complicate this discussion yep. about rap on trial because I don't know if you, Killer Mike is an advocate mm -hmm. for the freedom of speech, but also really cares about the livelihoods of these young people. Right, in, and he's a, he loves the Second Amendment. He thinks the Second Amendment should be first, really. 
that. No, he's, or, he, yeah. he told me today he's, he likes the first better than the second, but he's a okay. fan of he these is, No, he's, he's uh, uh, you know, the perfect guy for you because he complicates everything. All right, Andy Mills, thanks so much for talking to Reason. Thanks, Nick. Okay.